And coming up, I'll be talking to the always interesting Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. Dr. Cavanaugh is a member of Infection Control Today's Editorial Advisory Board. He's also a frequent contributor to our print and website publications. Dr. Cavanaugh has been ahead of the curve throughout this crisis, calling COVID-19 a, a pandemic long before anybody else did, and questioning the wisdom of trying to reopen too quickly. He's going to talk about the hazards in reopening too quickly, and also some of the best ways we can stop or at least slow COVID spread. You don't want to miss my interview with Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh coming up. For these and other stories, please go to infectioncontroltoday.com. Hi, I'm Frank Diamond, the Managing Editor of Infection Control Today, where we're giving infection preventionists and other healthcare professionals the information they need to battle COVID-19. There was a lot of information flying around a conference last week that was co-hosted by my guest, Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh. The title of the conference was, Through the Eyes of the Front Line, COVID-19. Sort of says it all. Dr. Cavanaugh is a member of Infection Control Today's editorial advisory board and a frequent contributor to our print editions and our website. A story he's written about the need for national reporting system for pathogens has gotten a lot of views. Doctor, as always, thanks for being with us here today. Well, thank you very much, Frank. So tell me about your conference last week. Please give us some highlights. Well, Frank, we were very, very fortunate to have four infectious disease experts from four different countries from around the world. And these countries were Spain, Netherlands, Singapore, and the United States. And I think it was very useful because, as you know, in the United States, a lot of people are not trusting the advice they're getting from the government and many different sources. And this way, they can go online to healthconference.org and listen to the health policy advice that they could get from other countries. And I think it's very beneficial. And there are a number of common themes that, uh, that we have saw. And one of the most common was that initially, most of the countries underestimated both the lethality and the infectivity of this contagion. And this resulted in changing guidance as the health departments of these various countries gained more information. But the public of the other countries bought into this changing guidance and their compliance was unbelievable. The Netherlands had a picture where the country had vacant streets in Amsterdam. It, it was unbelievable, the compliance. And because of this, they were able to drive down the curve. In the United States, unfortunately, as the recommendations changed, there started to be a narrative of, you can't trust the scientists, you can't trust the public health officials because they said this before, and therefore, we don't know what to do. And this is unfortunate because this has largely resulted in the public minimizing this pandemic and laying down and not doing the important sacrifices and implementing the strategies we need to stop the pandemic. And overall, two strategies were very important. One was the concept that closures followed by case tracking and social distancing could indeed stop the epidemic. And this was what primarily was done in Amsterdam and in the Netherlands. I don't believe they had a mask mandate, although a lot of people could wear masks, but it wasn't mandated. They did this through closures. Everybody complied, they drove the cases down and then had case tracking. And this was very important. In the United States, we tried to implement closures. It was done kind of haphazardly. Not everybody abided by them. And we never really did drive our cases down to the level where we could implement case tracking. And of course, the second strategy, which is kind of, I think, the fallback one, is that of universal mask wearing. This will also stop transmission. And that will drive cases down, hopefully, to the point where we can do case tracking. Another theme that came about, which I thought was very important, was that of preparation. Singapore was an excellent example. They had, before the pandemic hit, a strategy of tracking people by cell phones and tracking their contacts by cell phones so that they could do case tracking and notification of individuals if they came in contact with the virus. 
course, in the United States, this strategy would have civil liberty implications, but nevertheless, it was used successfully. In addition, what was really impressive to me is that before the pandemic hit, they had three, almost three N95 masks available per resident, not wow. per healthcare worker, per resident in the, in the country. So it, they were much more prepared than we will. We were, even at the height of our stockpile, we did not have that. We had less than 100 million N95 masks in a country that had 400 plus or 300 plus million people. I mean, that's, uh, that's way too little. Right. And so I think that that's important. And the other thing that came across was the importance of having an integrated national strategy and also a healthcare system which is available for all. And that allows people to get treated, to get tracked, and really does allow for you to implement these public health initiatives. And the one caveat which came about was out of Singapore, because they did not have a, a fully integrated system with migrant workers. They were living in dorms. And the migrant workers were responsible for one of their outbreaks or one of their later peaks that they had. And it's an example of that we all live in the same fishbowl. If you ignore one segment of the society with infectious disease, they can serve as a nidus to infect us all and putting all of our lives at risk. And of course, a common theme that testing and contact tracing is key to driving down the cases. So we need to do more, not less of that. We're talking recent history. Did anything that was said at the conference give anybody there, or you in particular, an idea of how ideally we should proceed in dealing with COVID-19? Well, definitely. We should be funding testing and contact tracing and not cutting it back and also funding the CDC. Those proposals, to me, just don't make sense. Granted, testing will, over the course of a very few days, if you increase testing, you'll increase cases. But by identifying cases, you can have patients self-isolate and start doing contact tracing. It is just key when you have so many infections caused by asymptomatic carriers. So that testing will very rapidly result in a decrease in cases, not an increase. Mm -hmm. So this is very disheartening that that money is being cut. And, and I think that that is not going to be helpful. In fact, it may be a severe misstep in controlling this virus. The other thing is that the concentration or that we have on the lethality, in other words, how many deaths there are, that is certainly something that is done between many of the different countries. But there's also a growing realization that there is a lot of disability that is coming about from just getting the virus and becoming severely infected. So it's not that you've recovered from the virus, it's that you've more survived it if you're in the hospital, because a large percentage of these individuals will have sequela. There was also a theme of looking at not only case definitions of what is a infection, because as you know, people will argue over that forever. If a person died of a heart attack, or did they die of the virus? Who knows? The virus causes hypercoagulability, which could cause a heart attack. Right. So you can argue that forever. So what they are using in Europe, and we're starting to do this in the United States, is looking at what our historical death rate has been over this period of time, and looking what the actual death rate is. Subtracting the two, and getting from there an estimation of what the lethality of the virus is. And in general, those type of estimations in the United States shows that if anything, our tracking has been underestimating the lethality of this virus. Have any countries, do, do any countries stand out in your mind as having done a worse job in the United States? I mean, in my mind, I mean, Iran and, and Italy come spring right to your mind. Is that, is that a fair uh, assessment? Well, I think that initially, yes. Um, now, I'm not sure about Iran, where their current status is, but if you look at uh, Italy, initially they did a worse job than the United States on the get-go, but they learned, they modified their strategies, the people bought into the strategies as a whole, and they were able to drive their cases down. 
We, on the other hand, went through a similar process where, at least on the front end, we didn't do quite as badly. But when we started to learn that the lethality of this virus was greater than what we thought it was, and so was its infectivity, and we had to modify our strategies, our public didn't buy into this. And this is the main problem that we're currently having. And I should also note that the lethality of this virus is going to fall because of one, we're protecting our elderly better. And two, we have so many new treatments of rindesivir, dexamethasone, antibiotic serum. And all of this is going to decrease the lethality of the virus. But those that survive are going to have lasting problems. And how long they'll last, we don't know. And these are multi-system problems because this virus affects every system of the body. It's not just a pulmonary virus. So that is one of the problems we have, is a lot of people are underestimating the long-term effects of this virus and its impact on our economy and our society. And we need to get on board following healthcare advice. This is, this is based on initial data, I take it, right? I mean, there haven't been any official studies about the long-term effects, have there? Or those are just starting to come out. There are some surveys of patients that are, have been discharged and a large percentage, almost 50%, are having long-term complaints. And a lot of these have to do with sleepiness, what's called post-viral fatigue syndrome. A lot of them have difficulty in breathing, which of course is very disturbing because one of the things you worry about is pulmonary fibrosis. And there are also initial reports of problems with uh, kidney function when you've been in the ICU or very sick from this virus. And of course, we've heard of the delayed effects of this virus with the immunological system, both on hypercoagulability and also on the Kawasaki's-like disease, which is emerging in children. So the more we're learning about this virus, the more we're learning you have to respect it. Was there any discussion at your conference about the vulnerable populations to this uh, virus uh, when it first hit. Everybody said if you're older and you had comorbidities, you're part of the vulnerable population. Now we're reading and hearing stories that younger people are getting it. Uh, I don't think there's any hard data yet on how that's trending. Maybe you know something. Uh, was there any discussion at the conference about that? Well, that really wasn't a huge issue. And, and I think there's two things that you have to realize about the United States. The idea of segmenting a certain percentage of the population as being expendable and mitigating this virus in the young really didn't occur in many of the other countries. Mm. Lethality was lethality. They didn't differentiate. Well, it's just occurring in the older. Those were more political talking points, which were just emerging in the United States. And to be honest with you, in the healthcare industry, I've never heard those before. A life is a life. We don't have the moral authority to say that an older life is any less important than a younger one. And the mitigation of the effects of the virus in the young, again, we concentrated on just whether you lived or died, and if you lived, you were recovered. That type of thinking was not going on in the other countries. They respected this virus from the get-go, knowing that virus illnesses can cause long-lasting effects, even if you survive it. Anything else you want to add about the conference and, and what you learned and what you hope will spread from that conference? After the greater well, market? yes, the, the main thing is, is please, if you don't believe the public health advice of our officials and how we're handling the conference, log in to healthconference.org and watch some of these other videos of these experts from around the world, and you will get the overall impression that they're taking this very seriously and investing a lot of resources, both of the society and of healthcare, in order to get this epidemic under control. They are not having coronavirus parties because you need to remember, if you're infected with this virus, you're gonna carry that virus genome in your cells probably the rest of your life, and we do not know what the long-term effects are. We really do need to take the virus seriously. Herd immunity is not counted upon anywhere. Uh, even I think Sweden is beginning, beginning to have significant doubts regarding that. 
and antibody levels look like they're fading rather rapidly. Granted, you can have memory cells, but it's not a good sign. So we need to respect this virus. So go to healthconference.org and please look at some of our videos. Dr. Kevin Cavanaugh, as always, thank you for being with us here at Infection Control Today. You're always here at Infection Control Today. You're a great contributor to our magazine and our website. Thanks again. Thank you, Frank. I appreciate it.